uh, in uh, now. Okay, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for tuning in for another um, episode of uh, Facebook Live. I think I'm going to be calling this Facebook Live Busa Secret Show moving forward, but today is just a Facebook Live. So we have here Rondi with us and also Aaron. Rondi, I think many of you already know me. Rondi is the boss and the head of Shopbeat Malaysia. And Aaron here we have is uh, the country manager for Luno, which to most of us will be very foreign concept because um, I think a lot of you know who's Rondi and Stockbit and stocks in general, but cryptocurrency, cryptocurrencies exchange, Luno, all these will sound like super foreign. So today we are here to find out. I know a lot of you are super skeptical about cryptocurrency because most of you only invest in stocks. And you've heard people kind of burn from uh, investing in cryptocurrencies. You also heard people making a lot of money from cryptocurrency. So today, let's get all our confusion answered. And the, the whole reason why we are doing this Facebook Live was, uh, if you remember, in the previous Facebook Live with Rondi, where we discussed about growth stock bodies, um, we knew that he diversified into in investing in cryptocurrency. And I also see it very interesting cryptocurrency this thing because i see a lot of people investing in them even those people that i respect but i think it's stupid right so today let us welcome a, a proper expert on it uh, who is aaron to talk about it but before that i'll invite rondi to share with us what's the flow today um, and both of us will be moderating this conversation one last disclaimer is there's no recommendation to buy and sell. Me and Rondi, both of us are super newbie. I'm the most newbie uh, in terms yeah. of cryptocurrency. So um, we are going to be asking questions. Um, so let's pass the floor to Rondi. Rondi, maybe you can share with us what's the flow. OK, so I think um, we'll try and make this session uh, very informative, but at the same time, uh, pack, you know. Um, so I think maybe for the first 20 minutes to half an hour, we will give the floor to Aaron. And we would like to cover five topics, actually, Aaron. Um, firstly is, um, who is Luno? You know, who is Luno? Secondly is, um, what is cryptocurrency? Uh, and what are the types of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all these sort of things? And more imp most importantly is, uh, why shall we invest in cryptocurrency? Um, fourthly uh, is the common arguments um, against investing in cryptocurrency. And lastly is how to invest in cryptocurrency. Um, so I think these are the first five topics that we would hand over the uh, the floor to you. Um, and after that, yeah, we'll just have um, quite an informal Q&A and chit chat session. Shall we do that? Yeah, of course we should do that. But before that, can I engage with the audience for a while? So we have Danny typing, I'm here. So Jocelyn also, hello. Oh, I, Irene, hello. Ryan. Hi, Ryan. Uh, Mohammed actually tagged his friend. So, guys, if you think this talk may benefit your friend or anybody that is interested in investing in crypto or they are a big skeptic or they are a big believer, get them here. Join this conversation. Okay? Hi, Kenny. And uh, can everybody type in coin? Because I don't want you to type in other things. Sometimes Facebook, uh, when they see the other words, uh, they, they will ban one. You know, there was a point of time. You type in, you know, crypto or Bitcoin or what, they will just ban your page. So you guys type in coin, huh? nothing else, I just coin, right? Then press a love and share this video and we are good to go. So Aaron, I'll pa pass this floor to you. Um, maybe yes, you can Aaron. share yeah. what your company so, does. Yeah, the first the first question is, uh, who is Luno? <laughs> yep. Hi, hi guys. Thanks, Randy and Mingtek for the introduction. So Luno is the first and also the market leading digital asset exchange in Malaysia. When I say uh, digital asset exchange, that is the official term that the Securities Commission uses for cryptocurrency exchanges in Malaysia. So there are a couple of cryptocurrency exchanges that have been approved to operate in Malaysia. We were the first one and we hold the largest market share. We've been around actually in Malaysia for a very long time now, since 2016 when we started operating. Um, but yeah, we officially got the approval from the Securities Commission to start operating in Malaysia starting October 2019. So it's been about one year now since we've gotten the official approval. 
And yeah, I'm very happy to be here to, to share a little bit more about the topic of digital assets. All right, guys... Aaron, um, thank you. So Luno is an exchange as far as we know. So it's sort of like a Busa exchange, right? Come in, everybody type in Busa Malaysia, <laughs> right? Um, let me say that, yeah, it is like a Busa Malaysia, but they are also acting, actually they are Busa Malaysia and UOB together because in that one app, you can buy stocks and they are also the exchange. So it's like, type in, everybody type in Busa Malaysia. It's sort of like Busa Malaysia for crypto and you can buy and sell through the app itself, right? So that's what Luno is all about. And the cool thing is, actually there's a reason why Aaron uh, is invited here. Because for me personally, what I see is Busa, Securities Malaysia is like a very strict platform. If you get, you know, their recognition, hey, that means, you know, you are doing something right. It's like sort of legit. That's why we also have stash away on the platform, all this. Uh, the thing that attracted me is a Securities Malaysia name, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, that's why we like it. So maybe you can share a little bit about what is this cryptocurrency that, you know, so many people want to know about. Um, and um, what, the, what, what, what is it and how does it work, this cryptocurrency? Why would people buy and sell it? Cool. So the word cryptocurrency, as you can see, it comes from the two, it's, it's like a combination of two different words, which is crypto and currency. Now, crypto, it refers to cryptography, which is the technology behind um, encryption, which is... It may sound like a bit of like a high tech thing, but actually we use this technology of cryptography in everyday transactions. Whatever you do online banking, whatever you use on your internet browser, most of that is already secured by cryptography. Currency is the other term that is part of this cryptocurrency. And currency is, is there because when the designers of the first cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin, they wanted to create a form of what they call digital cash. So if the word cryptocurrency, it sounds a bit intimidating or big or, or scary, just think of cryptocurrency as another way to describe it is digital assets. Actually, that is the term that the, <clears throat> excuse me, actually that is the term that the Securities Commission, actually they like to use. They call it digital asset. So when you say digital asset, I think it's a bit more, um, I guess it, is, it gives a better picture of what actually cryptocurrencies are. It is something that is completely digital, meaning that it exists on the internet and it is an asset, meaning that you can buy it, you can sell it, you can send it to your friends, you can trade it. This is the world of digital assets. Now, when you, when you say that um, why people are investing in cryptocurrency, there are many, many reasons for investing in cryptocurrency. I'll give you an example of the most famous cryptocurrency, which is Bitcoin. So a lot of people see Bitcoin as a form of digital gold because Bitcoin is very, very scarce or rather the supply is very, very limited. And then the demand has been increasing over the, over the past 12 years. So if you see the graph of Bitcoin price, it has really increased over the past 12 years. And um, I think that's why a lot of people get hooked and get attracted to it. So Bitcoin is the first really uh, popular cryptocurrency. It remains the most famous cryptocurrency until today. Okay, so I'm gonna just pause a while. ming did you get that? Did that sound okay? Or do you have any questions? Yep, um, I'll just uh, let Rondi ask a question. Okay. No, I think I think that's, that's good for now, Aaron. Uh, please continue. <laughs> okay. Cool. So in Malaysia, there are actually four cryptocurrencies that can be traded uh, on the what we call the regulated exchanges. These four currencies are these four digital assets are Bitcoin, Ethereum, XRP, and Litecoin. Now I will just go into each of these coins very, very briefly, shortly. But I just wanted to say that actually in this world there are thousands and thousands of digital assets and cryptocurrencies and more are being created every day however the fact is in malaysia that the securities commission is actually quiet they call it um they're quite conservative they want to protect the investors 
So they only allow so far these four cryptocurrencies or digital assets for trading. Now, if you decide to go on an overseas platform yourself and you are willing to bear the risk, yeah, you can trade like all kinds of weird, funny, different kind of coins. Um, you know, some people would consider it gambling or speculation. But in Malaysia, we have these four that are regulated and uh, traded lah, on, on the regulated platforms. So we've talked a little bit about Bitcoin, which is the first one. Now, Bitcoin, without going into too much technical detail, I like to say that it is like form of digital gold because the supply is limited and the demand continues to go up. The supply of Bitcoin is limited due to its code and its algorithm. So we'll not dive too deep into this. You can ask questions about that if you wish. So a lot of people see Bitcoin as a hedge against inflation. Um, in recent times, uh, when I say recent times, like over the past few weeks and months, the correlation between Bitcoin and gold has become quite, quite, uh, the, the correlation has increased. So, and recently there was an article out, I think today, that JP Morgan came out with a report saying that a lot of people are considering Bitcoin as a form of digital gold. So yeah, if you think about Bitcoin, you can think about digital gold. Uh, Mingtek, you have something to ask? I no, see you. Uh, I, I better shut up now first. I don't want to interrupt first. I'll let you <laughs> talk first because I have a lot of objection in my head now. Okay. Right? A lot of objection, but I don't yeah. want to bring the objection, otherwise we will go on and on. So, yeah. yeah. So what is the difference? With, if, if that's the case, uh, why don't we just use cash now? I mean, if it's digital cash, why can't we just... I mean, now our cash is looking all right, right? I can transfer money over to somebody else, to other countries, right? Why, why should I use Bitcoin as a currency? Or yeah. or I think if we go down this angle, the whole reason why Bitcoin was created, if you look at the original white paper of Bitcoin, 2008, the written, as I guess you can call it, the manifesto of Bitcoin was that the US government, or rather the, the world governments at that point of time, they had bailed out their banks, which were in trouble during the 2008-2009 financial crisis. So a lot of the proponents of Bitcoin are investing in Bitcoin because unlike fiat currencies, which can be inflated, uh, you can do quantitative easing, you can expand the monetary supply depending on the central bank's policies. A lot of people are investing in Bitcoin because the supply of that is limited. So they feel that it is, um, I guess it makes more sense for, for them because they believe in something that is scarce and not cannot be just easily inflated according to policies. Okay, so this point, I have another rebuttal, but I shut up first. Otherwise, we'll go on and on. Rondi, do you have anything uh, to ask or you uh, you want to move on to the next question? Yeah. No, I think uh, let's move on to the next question, Aaron. Um, yeah. Which so, is, yeah. Uh, what's the difference between, you know, um, because you say there were four different kind of coins. Would you like to spend a little time to talk about what are the uh, the coins in the platform and what are the subtle difference between them because if i look at it right um, bitcoin in terms of the price movement it's a bit different because it's now close to the previous high but the rest are it's sort of like the same 2007 spike up then all drop then now slowly climb back up like, but still very far from their previous high so maybe you can share a little bit about that yep so We've spoken a bit about Bitcoin and why we always start with Bitcoin because it is the most established cryptocurrency. If you want to understand the world of cryptocurrency, you always start with Bitcoin. So now we move on to the second coin, which is Litecoin. And Litecoin was created as a lightweight alternative to Bitcoin. Litecoin, without going too deep into the, the technology, Litecoin, it is designed to process transactions faster and it is designed to be a lightweight alternative of Bitcoin. So for example, if you made a transaction with, with Bitcoin to anywhere around the world, it would take you say 60 minutes. Litecoin is designed to be faster than 60 minutes. Um, okay. Yeah, similar to Bitcoin, Litecoin supply is limited and Bitcoin has a supply of 21 million lifetime supply. Litecoin has four times that. So Litecoin is basically a, a lighter, I guess, cheaper, faster version of Bitcoin. 
and you know if you want to use another image you can consider it like the digital silver to coin digital gold okay yeah and so, so what, are the, uh, what are the you know um how correlated are all these four cryptocurrencies um say in 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 terms of their prices yeah so the re correlation between all four cryptocurrencies are pretty high actually if you look at the the entire crypto market just because bitcoin itself is so dominant and everything kind of pulls its you know everything is kind of linked back to bitcoin bitcoin remains the dominant cryptocurrency lah. so the correlation is high indeed you know something that you guys pointed out which is why i think if you are actually a new beginner investor to crypto digital assets and you just want to get your first taste you don't even have to worry about like the thousands of other coins you just start with bitcoin which is the most established the, there's been the most research written about it there's been the most uh is the most liquid you can find it anywhere in, around the world so i think that would be the advice like if you're just starting out okay so um so for be any beginner here one thing just remember if you just want to get into crypto everybody say crypto is a thing we look at bitcoin first right don't look at anything else just look at bitcoin first i know there are some questions on the chat box getting very heated even though we are talking about something else wow the questions there is already very heated right so yeah man um there were few people asking questions uh, on what happened in year 2017 and 18 which is what we just discussed before we open this live so guys we will not be skipping the question don't worry we will be answering it right so please stay with us all the way to the end when we have a q a all the questions guys um i just want to be very uh, upfront with you your questions will be answered so just stay with us once we finish uh, sharing what we want to share we are going to be uh, putting out your question and whatever thing that you are uh, discussing here, we will address it. And uh, if you have any opinion, you just share it there, right? That's why we have this kind of platform. Everybody have a voice, right? So help us click the share button or like button. Please don't press the angry emoji, lah, right? We haven't done anything. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, of all the coins I see, Ethereum is the one that is going up the most followed by Bitcoin, and I was surprised to see Ripple and Litecoin actually appreciate this year, you know, over the past year. So uh, later we talk about that, uh, huh? once we we talk about um, the exchanges and what will be your point. Let's say if you want to persuade me to invest in crypto, okay, what will be your top three points? Like Convince me to invest in crypto now. Give me three points. Why am I invest in crypto or Ethereum or Bitcoin? All right. Do you want to go into the differences in Ethereum and XRP first before we sure. get into it? Right? Yeah, yeah, you can. You talk about that, then after that, you can come to us. Okay, I can. I so definitely wait. want to understand about XRP and Ethereum. So yeah, enlighten us, please, Adam. So yep. Ethereum is the, by market cap, in the world of cryptocurrencies, Ethereum is actually the second largest one after Bitcoin. And Ethereum is very, very interesting because Ethereum, you can call it a, I guess you can call it a crypto platform that can allow a host of programming features on top of it. So again, sounds like a bit like technical mumbo jumbo, but just put in your mind that when Bitcoin was created, Bitcoin was created to be a little bit simpler in terms of it's created to be an asset that you can send, receive. You know, you can do a little bit of programming functions on it. But Ethereum is the one which has proven to be the most popular form of programmable digital asset. When I say programmable, meaning that you can actually build all kinds of smart functions onto your assets. So, for example, like um, if I want to build, a, if I want to create a token that will allow people on the internet to do some form of lending between each other i can do all that on the ethereum platform or if i want to do something like say people can um, um do like a what you call that some form of interest bearing account um you know i can program that using ethereum which is a little bit harder to do from bitcoin perspective because bitcoin doesn't have such a powerful programming language so yeah lee why saying us is it for financial use yes a lot of the programmable functions on Ethereum so far has been for uh, financial use. 
Yeah. So that's Ethereum. Uh, did I make sense or do you want me to give like some more examples, guys? I think uh, it makes a little bit of sense to me because I'm not a tech guy, but it makes sense to me in a way where um, I don't know what kind of thing you program, but I can imagine if it's in a financial institution, right? They have all sorts of things. They, they may want to touch interest on that. They may want to land that out. I don't know, right? They may want to do all sorts of magic with their, you know, banks, they do all sorts of magic with even your cash. So they may want to do that, right? But maybe for Bitcoin, it's not that easy to do because as you say, even to transfer money, it can take like like so long, right? Um, and am I right? That yeah. Maybe the code wise, it's more flexible for you to do all sorts of uh, mathematics. Yeah. Right? So just to clarify, Bitcoin may seem like it takes long to transfer because we are used to instant transfers and domestic instant transfers happen instantly. But let's say you wanted to send money to some European, Eastern European com country that you had to rely on a SWIFT network. That might take you two to three working days. Uh, it might cost you 20 to 25 US dollars. So in terms of Bitcoin, no difference. We transfer anywhere around the world. That takes 60 minutes. But back to your point around some of the cool features that Ethereum will allow. There's this trend that's going on in the world, which is called DeFi, which is decentralized finance. And decentralized finance is basically trying to replicate the traditional financial system, but in the internet world, okay? So today, for example, you can put your deposit in the bank and then you earn some interest. There is a cryptocurrency digital asset version of that. There are multiple versions of that, by the way, and they are programmed using Ethereum. A lot of these platforms are programmed using Ethereum. So for example, you could put your digital asset with uh, a, 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 you call it a smart contract, but you can just think about it as a, an entity. You put your money there and then you get say 6% interest per year. But it's all done in digital assets. You don't have to walk into the bank. You don't have to fill up a form, nothing. It's completely online and virtual. So that's an example of what can be done with Ethereum. Or but for some reason, with uh, Litecoin and Bitcoin, it cannot be done. Yeah, so the, the pro programming functions on Bitcoin and Litecoin are not as powerful as Ethereum. So that's why Ethereum has a different use case from Bitcoin and Litecoin. Yeah, um, yeah. so I think I don't want to ask in depth into that because I don't know about the programming stuff. Yeah, so yep. Um, how about Ripple? Yeah, so Ripple or XRP is a bit of an interesting one because unlike the other coins, uh, like say Bitcoin, uh, Litecoin, Ethereum, which are very much more decentralized in nature. And when we say decentralized, means it's not controlled by any one company, any one person or anything. It's like, it's just like the internet, it grows everywhere. Whereas Ripple was actually founded by a company. And the use case of Ripple or XRP was more to do with, uh, they wanted to use it for allowing remittance between countries to be fast and cheap. So a lot of banks have actually trialed this uh, digital asset called XRP, uh, including banks in Malaysia, I think CIMB and if I'm not mistaken, RHB has also done some trials using XRP. Uh, globally, there's a bunch of banks, they have consortium, they also use XRP. Um, XRP's purpose is for remittance. Again, you know, we are used to instant transfers in Malaysia, happens instantly, but what happens if you try and send USD to, I don't know, somewhere in Arizona or something, it's, it's a completely different experience and XRP was designed to, to allow that to happen faster and cheaper. Hmm. Personally, I feel XRP is uh, more practical as a currency. Yeah, this is much faster. And yeah, you're right. If you do wire transfer, uh, those that try to invest in TD Ameritrade or Interactive Broker, the other day, only Rondi was complaining to me. Um, he asked me what cannabis stock was I investing in, and I told told him it's an OTC counter. You want to buy the real chair, you buy from Canada. Then he's like, ah, lazy to fund into my IB because it takes wire transfer and all this problem. So, I mean, in the future, if you can do instant transfer to overseas, it could be a good thing. But I was I'm worried about the fluctuation because if I have cash, the whole reason for me to keep cash is to not have volatility, but all these cryptocurrencies, it is volatile, right? Yep. And it Aaron, is quite if, uh, I know, yeah. Um, if I'm not mistaken, XRP was the one that, you know, 
which the market cap was at one point bigger than Google or something like that, was it? Uh, or rather, the founder was richer than the founders of Google. Potentially, the founder. In 2018, yeah. <laughs> but That's I mean, crazy. It's, it's a bit of a, I guess you can call it a bit of a, I guess you can say that, you know, I mean, you, you were right in the middle of the bubble and then you, ha- you also have to take into account that, yeah, on paper, maybe it looks like he's richer, but if he sold all his stock, the, the value of the currency, not not stock, if he sold all his coins, the value of the coins will also drop. So he's okay. probably not going to be able to liquidate his entire wealth into US dollars so easily. La. The liquidity just isn't there, la, I think. So okay. it be a bit of media hype, la, I think. Understand. Okay, yeah, so, shall we go to the next topic? Sure. Um, yeah, as yeah. in the next topic will be why invest in crypto? Yeah, why why shall we invest in cryptocurrency? Aaron? Okay, maybe I'll just share with everybody here um, the reason why I actually invested my first ever Bitcoin. Uh, prior to this, I've always thought that Bitcoin is just a bubble and I never understand um, the concept and I don't really understand the fundamental. As a matter of fact, even right now, I don't really understand the fundamental. That's why we invite you here, Aaron, right? <laughs> um, but what I would say is that my perception changed a little bit, um, especially during um, March, this year, March, you know? It was during when um, the, the Fed had started this all this entire of um, unlimited quantitative easing then it occurs to me that i'm like hey wait a minute if i'm just thinking from the point of view of supply right <clears throat> the supply of let's just say fiat currency the us dollars against supply of commodities such as gold or even like digital currency such as bitcoin um one has actually uh, went up tremendously and these two things, which is gold and Bitcoin, have actually been staying, you know. So in just in that manner, it it is it can be considered as undervalued. So that was my first sort of like logical explanation to myself. Right. So um yeah, so but I definitely need to understand a lot and a lot more in depth about um cryptocurrency, Bitcoin and whatnot. So yeah, please enlighten me some more, Aaron. Yeah. So I can actually buy more Bitcoin. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you brought up the the point about uh, supply and demand, Rondi, because I think that's a, a big, big angle of why people are investing in crypto. And the fact is, okay, I'm going to talk about Bitcoin because like I said, Bitcoin is the one that you want to go first for if you are new to this kind of thing. And the fact is that Bitcoin has limited supply. Its supply is also predictable and it is not only predictable, it is completely traceable. Like anyone with an internet connection can definitely look at Bitcoin and make sure that you know it's it's issued according to what it was said. You know, there's no fraud going on. Anyone can do that. Okay, so Bitcoin has limited supply, and like you said, there's currency devaluation going on all across the world. Um, most notably in developed countries, for example, say the US or the U- or, or the EU or the UK, where the governments are printing, printing. Well, you can say printing, or you can say they are increasing their monetary supply. So traditional conventional economics will say that if you increase the supply of something by a lot, its value should go down. And I'll give you an example. The US government um, balance sheet of the central bank, when I say balance sheet, I say the total assets of the central bank. Before 2008, it, was, it never even touched 1 trillion US dollars. But as of last week, the US central bank's assets are... 7 trillion 7.2 trillion dollars so in the space of 12 years that currency has increased by seven times in terms of the total assets in circulation now again conventional economics will say that you simply increase the quantity of something its value will go down versus something like gold so that's really the the first uh, argument for the the second argument is the you can call it the developing uh, developing country currency angle. So I don't know about you, but when I grew up in Malaysia, US dollar versus Malaysian ringgit was 2.5. Okay, I grew up very comfortable with that. Over the past 25 years, it has fallen to US dollar equals to 4.16 Malaysian ringgit. Um, so 
I think for a lot of us, we want to have at least part of our assets, if not all our assets, I think just a little bit of our assets in a hedge against this kind of inflation or devaluation. For some people, it is gold. Gold has remained a very, very popular thing for thousands of years. But yeah. uh, research, recent research has shown that more and more people, especially younger people, are preferring Bitcoin to gold as their inflation hedge. Now, the reasons, I don't know why, maybe people are more comfortable with digital today, but you know, the data is unmistakable. People are moving towards Bitcoin. So that's the second reason. Mm -hmm. Um, the third reason is basically the potential for large gains. And, um, you know, you mentioned something about volatility. It can go up, it can go down, which I think is, is true. Lah. I mean, if you want the, the potential to get high returns, you must also be prepared for the, for the possibility that it will, it will crash every once in a while. So if, if we look at the historical performance of Bitcoin, uh, and this has been documented in, in so many things, its performance has been the best asset class of the past 10 years. You know, um, whether you compare gold, oil, whatever, Bitcoin has performed better than anything else. Um, if you look at it in terms of the sharp ratio, and when we say sharp ratio, which means basically the performance over the volatility of an investment, adding something like say one, two, three, five percent into of Bitcoin into a portfolio has greatly increased uh, both the returns and also the sharp ratio of a traditional portfolio. So there's been recent articles that come out with a lot of research on that. And I think it basically just tells us that, you know, if you're not comfortable with buying a lot, add a little bit into your portfolio, you get all the, the benefits and yeah, you have the potential for a, a huge increase in value as well. So if you look at the volatility compared to the return, it's actually much better compared to the other asset class. Is that what you mean? Sharp ratio? So I've not looked at it 100% um, asset versus asset. As far as I understand, if you look at Bitcoin's sharp ratio over the past, say, five to seven years, I think it's like two point something or three point something, which as far as I understand is, is pretty good. But what I'm referring to is people have done studies on they take a traditional portfolio of 60% stocks, 40% bonds, and they added 1%. Okay, see how it performs. Then they added 3% of Bitcoin. Then they added 5% of Bitcoin. And the research has shown that over the past five years, seven years, that if you had done that, then your returns would have outperformed, say, just a normal 60-40 uh, kind of uh, portfolio. But Aaron, so, that, is, that is basically talking in terms of price performance, right? But if, let's say, I, I am to buy um, Bitcoin, right, I would probably think that I would like to invest this for a long period of time, let's just say five years and 10 years. So yeah. perhaps the question that um, I would like to ask is, is this the potential of, let's say, a, a 10 beggar, um, you know? And if it is, um, can you paint for me the picture on um, why you think that the price is going to go 10 times from today in say the next five years what yep. what sort of like economies or what sort of infrastructure that um our global kind of like our world is going to have or be in the future that make bitcoin um, and cryptocurrency so valuable in the future if it is um, really something that we can invest now yep cool so let me give you some statistics um, mm -hmm. Research has shown that probably 1% or 2% of the world's population have already invested into digital assets. So the first point is that it's really, really early. Lah. If you think you are late to crypto, Bitcoin, you are not late to it. It's only been around for 12 years. Only 1% to 2% of the population has yeah, invested in it. Now, if we take comparison between market size, the market cap of Bitcoin is roughly around, I think today it's probably around slightly below $300 billion. All the Bitcoin in the world, uh, by the way, is worth below $300 billion. Compared combined. To, yeah, combined. Everything in the world is probably below $300 billion. Compare it to, say, an asset like gold. There's probably 8 or $9 trillion of gold assets in the world. So if you believe in the case of, say, Bitcoin as a form of digital gold, and you say that, okay, I think... Bitcoin will maybe only do, uh, it will maybe only overtake, say, 15% of gold or 20%. 
that I believe is going to increase the price of Bitcoin by um, a, a multiple. Like, it's not going to go up like 20%. It might go up like three, three or four times in price. If it just gets to say um, uh, even 10 or 15% of the gold market cap. So that's the other thing. Um, the other thing is because Bitcoin is traceable, you can look at the, you know, you can look at what is the activity that is happening on the, um, what do you call that, on the blockchain or the Bitcoin network. You can see that over the years, the number of people who have been using Bitcoin has increased. And we're talking about, we, we, we use a term called active addresses, which is the number of addresses that are actively sending Bitcoin to each other. If you look at it back in, say, 2013, it was below 100,000. If you look at it today, it's like 1 million active addresses are using Bitcoin on a monthly basis. So you can see that it's behaving a bit like, a, you can call it like a, a tech stock. Lah, you know, the number of users continues to grow. And as you know, in any tech kind of uh, stock, or any kind of tech app or any kind of uh, thing like Grab or Uber, the number of people that use it, the more people that use it, the more valuable it becomes. So again, we're now just at like one or two percent. You know, what happens if 10% of the world's population uses Bitcoin? I think there's a huge growth for potential there. Huge potential for growth there, yeah. Okay. Um... You know, we have a lot of questions. Even I have a lot of questions now in my head running. Um, I And I want to organize it in a way. But I just want to, you know, bring all the things that we want to ask the proper things first, which is the next one, uh, which is also a very important thing to talk about here today, is what are the differences between the exchanges? Because um, as far as I know, there are many exchanges that, you can use to trade Bitcoin, even eToro, you can use eToro to trade Bitcoin, but the commission is very high. So maybe you can share about what are the differences between the exchanges and what is the difference between Luno and other exchanges, especially in Malaysia? Yep. So the first thing I want to say is that there are regulated exchanges. And I say regulated means we are approved by the SC. Okay, there are three that are in Malaysia that are regulated. You can check us out. So the first thing I want to say, if you, especially if you're new, please trade on regulated exchanges. Because if you trade on an unregulated exchange, the risk is going to be higher. You may not know you are trading with who. You may be trading with a criminal or a drug trafficker or something like that. Um, and a lot of these unregulated exchanges, they don't even have an office in Malaysia. They don't report to, you know, they don't report to the SE. They don't report to anybody. If the exchange goes down and gets hacked, you basically have nothing. You 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 can't do anything. Like you can send them a letter. Lah, but if they're say based in Malta or Vietnam, they're not gonna do anything about it. Whereas a regulated exchange, if you trade on there and something goes wrong, you can of course send a letter to the exchange. If you feel tapwasati, you're not happy with what the exchange says, you can complain to the SC. The SC will take action as well. It will run an investigation. Still not happy, you can complain to the police. You know, we regulated exchanges have an office in Malaysia, literally. Like, you know, you can raise police reports and the police will investigate. So that's the first thing I want to say about regulated versus unregulated exchanges. The other thing about differences between exchanges is that um, it, it differs in terms of the number of coins that they offer. So, for example, we offer all four coins. There may be exchanges that offer only Bitcoin and Ethereum, or they may offer other coins which are less or more, okay? Um, in Malaysia, we have the most, by the way, which is four. Uh, in terms of liquidity, and I say liquidity is because there is a bit of competition for attention between exchanges. So the exchange with the highest liquidity will give you the, the best price, lah, basically, because you can buy, there's more supply available to be traded. So you would also need to compare between liquidity on exchanges. And then you can compare in terms of features. Like, for example, some exchanges have FPX, which is instant transfers. So if you make a deposit, your money will arrive immediately. Whereas some exchanges, they, they use uh, bank transfer. So these are all the features that you can compare. And I would like to encourage, if you have not tried before, um, I would like to encourage you to try Luno. I believe that we have the best exchange. Of course, I'm biased, but yeah. Uh, best exchange in terms of it's very liquid in terms of liquidity 
in terms of safety, security features, um, and in, even in terms of education, we also have a pretty informative uh, website and help center and blog. We have YouTube, we have all kinds of things. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, the last thing I want to mention is that we also have a, a, an app. So some of the exchanges, they are still not yet reaching the level of apps, so they're trading more on the website. So we have an app which is makes it more convenient and easy for everyone. Yep. Okay, so now that we've got all the you know necessary questions out, I think, I think, I think this question yeah. we will have to, uh, I think this, this topic about yeah. the different exchanges, we will definitely need to come back to you again, Aaron, because I see many comments that is talking about this, you know, and yeah. talking about the past experience with Luno. Yeah. Um, but maybe just one, um, one last question before we move to the Q&A, right? I just want to find out, you know, because sometimes, of course, um, being an investor myself, I I need to look into the both the pros and the cons about investing in something, right? So you have mentioned just now about the pros of investing in uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin, which I totally understand. I mean, well, I would say I am 60%, I understand it, you know. But can I just, you know, um, ask you what are the... Um, what are the com common um, arguments against investing in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin? Like what, 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 what is, um, you know, the, the biggest resistance that people on the street ask you, like, I do not want to invest in Bitcoin because this, 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 this. Yeah, yeah. maybe you can just highlight that. So we have a little bit more balanced opinion, yeah. like, you know. Okay. I'm going to give you a, an interesting answer because I just realized this pretty recently as well. If you mm -hmm. ask an average guy on the street now, what is why what are their objections against investing in crypto they'll come up with something like usually it's like oh but isn't crypto used for bad purposes like money laundering you know isn't it uh, a very bad thing you know it's used for drugs and stuff or they will say that oh you know this can be hacked you know so if you ask a a, a, a layman usually that will be their answer and of course, mm -hmm. there's a rebuttal to that. Uh, and the rebuttal to that is if you manage your security properly, you manage your, your keys properly, um, and you trade on regulated exchanges, then you should be safe, lah, okay, in, in terms of the, the safety of your crypto. Uh, if you talk about drug trafficking, money laundering, and stuff like that, all these things happen in crypto. But I would say that is actually a very, very small percentage of what's happening in crypto. Most of the activity is actually legitimate activity and if you talk about drugs ma money laundering whatever most of it actually happens in the world of cash lah, okay so that is the common common what you call that uh, thing that people have against crypto but if you go to the investing world you know if you go to people who already started to invest in other things i realize that their objections against crypto is usually something to do about fundamentals okay how do i value crypto how do I, you know, can I do, um, can I do discounted cash flow or can I do PE ratio? You know, okay, what's the dividend yield? Okay, if I'm owning a stock, I own a part of the business. But if I own crypto, what do I own? Okay, so if you go and talk to investors, they have that kind of objections, not the money laundering and stuff like that, which is more of the the average person. So I would say that, um, admittedly, Bitcoin crypto is something that is very new, and a methodology that can be say very very accurately to to use to value things it is not 100 percent there yet okay i would say that it is still in its infancy there's many people who draw up research papers you know they use different kind of metrics and i can share you a link probably ming take and rondi i can share you like uh, you know how to value bitcoin website like tons of research papers there that you can read right um and i will say that it is very different from how you value, say, a stock or how you value a currency or how you value a commodity. And the reason for that is because Bitcoin, crypto, the nature of the asset itself it is not a stock. It is not really a currency. It is not really a commodity as well. It has like a little bit here, a little bit there. So because of that, it is actually a little bit tough to value with absolute certainty. So I would say that, you know, for those who are investing a little bit confused, I would say that when you invest in crypto, you're investing for like you're investing in the future. You're investing like in a growth stock. You know, the 
the fundamentals that you are used to may not make sense to you right now, okay? So you may want to limit your risk in the amount of crypto that you buy. Maybe you want to allocate 1% and consider this like your experimental fund. Some people use used to do it this way. Some people say 3% or 5%. But I think that's the biggest thing about crypto right now. Like. The biggest objection is that it's not so easy to value crypto like how you would do with, say, stocks or something else. Okay. okay. Can I just also find out, um, just coming back to the point on on why you can invest in Bitcoin, right? Because a lot of my friends are saying that the reason why nowadays it's um, it's a lot more substance um, to invest in Bitcoin is because now it has been in, it has become like institutionalized and all that. So what does that mean actually, and and what sort of risk has been reduced by institutionalizing um, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin and stuff? So I would say that the when 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 we say institutionalizing of Bitcoin is that for the first few years of Bitcoin's um, existence, uh, it wasn't easy for companies to buy Bitcoin. You know, because as a company, sometimes you are bounded by certain rules. Okay, companies cannot go and simply invest in like something because they have uh, rules to follow, regulations to follow. Um, but increasingly in recent times, we have seen opportunities for people to invest in Bitcoin, crypto. For example, custodians or, you know, we have seen crypto funds, meaning that these funds are institutions that are licensed institutions, and then they offer the ability to invest in crypto. So I'll give you an example. Um, our sister company, which is Grayscale Investments, G-R-A-Y-S-C-A-L-E. Grayscale is the largest fund provider uh, for people who want to invest into Bitcoin. So when you buy something with Grayscale, you are not investing in Bitcoin directly. You are buying a fund. It is a bit like an ETF, okay? It's a bit like an exchange traded fund. It is not an ETF, but it is a fund. And Grayscale has this year, I think they've increased their asset under management to $7 billion. So it is a sign that a lot of institutions are starting to buy into Bitcoin. And that, I think, leads to, you know, why people are starting to uh, warm up to the idea. And there's been a couple of very public companies, for example, Square Cash, uh, MicroStrategy. These are large tech companies who have also started buying Bitcoin to as a part of their strategy. Okay. I think Mingtik is a big... Pro uh, I think Mingtik is a, is a lover of this tech counter called square right Ming -tick. yeah <laughs> really? um yeah um but unfortunately i didn't get to invest much in them uh. i mean like all these tech counter fly up so fast uh, how to buy a bit a bit by the time you buy a bit they already fly but recently they just reported 140 percent increase in revenue most of mm -hmm. the revenue came from bitcoin mm -hmm. um, trading i believe they will soon become the biggest bitcoin exchange man, if this goes on they may become the biggest Bitcoin exchange in the world. So the, um, the interesting thing about Square is, uh, well, on the back end, they actually don't run a Bitcoin exchange. They're more like a broker, okay? So they, mm -hmm. I think they work with an exchange on the back end. Lah. So they are the customer-facing thing. On the back end, they work with the exchange. So yeah, it's a very interesting business model that we hopefully can roll out in Malaysia with other brokers as well, you know? So we power the, the back end and the brokers power the front end. Yeah. If you can... If you can collaborate with, like, say, Grab or what, uh, wow, that would be crazy, man. That Grab will become the super app, man. Everything yeah. you can do there. So anyway, um, yeah, I have one last question, which is related to what we say. Before I go and ask all the questions from the floor, and I personally have some objections to ask you. So the biggest question will be here, um, what does it take for you to be regulated? Because in the in the floor, there are so many questions about, you know, there are this platform that's not regulated, there's another platform, you know, all these things. So what does it take for you to be regulated by SC? And what does it mean, right? What, what criteria do you need to pass that other exchange, other platform cannot pass? Yeah. So very, very good question. Um, the SC, the SC, their main priority from day one when we go and apply for the approval is investor protection okay that is their number one priority so when we submitted our application we have to prove that we have investors best interests in mind so a few things that we have to make sure that we pass the test is things like 
our security. Okay, we have to list out all our procedures of how we store people's funds. Why is it safe? We have to use a trustee. Uh, a trustee meaning that uh, the ringgit that you deposit into our account, the account doesn't belong to us. We cannot run away with the money. Okay, it is a licensed trustee. Uh, apart from that, we have to show how our order book works so there is no market manipulation. Okay, we have to prove that you know we cannot. Uh, I cannot you know go and pump and dump the price myself because I work in in Luno. Um, and then I think the the other thing which is uh, perhaps it sounds very simple. The company must be incorporated in Malaysia. It must have compliance officer in Malaysia, and the the key management people must be based in Malaysia. That is an important point, because again, if you run an exchange from say, uh, I don't know Hong Kong or say overseas, the accountability is not so strong because you know what happens if there's a hack or something happens to you know there's market manipulation. What what are you going to do? So. The SC's purpose of putting all these things in place again is to protect the investors locally in Malaysia. So number one, you have somebody that you can find and catch if something goes wrong. You have yeah. an office as well. Yep. Um, somebody actually check you and your securities commission don't play play. They they will check whether you are trading against an investor. Mm -hmm. The money will be placed with your trusty account, not mm -hmm. your account, not. Mm -hmm. uh, Luno's bank account, but a trustee account linked back yep. to the person's name. So yep. impossible to run away with the money. And um, I mean, actually, there are stories about people getting hacked. How does it work? Is it possible for Luno getting hacked? So, you know, if you if you talk 100% in terms of possibilities, you know, if you're being honest, there's always this this tiny, tiny, minor possibility, right? Anything can happen. But, in it, but it's not imaginable la, now how they will do it, right? Yeah. yeah. So I would say that the, you know, this is not, I guess it's not a, a Luno specific thing, but, you know, overall, overwhelmingly in today's world, where most of the, the so-called hack happen is, um, you know, if people, uh, they... <laughs> they had their email hack and then in their email they 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 use the same password with uh, other account or in their email they 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 save their their password or they go and click a, a link that links them to a website that looks like maybank but it's actually not maybank and then they get fished of their information so i say the majority of attacks that happen today happen through this kind of method um, yeah, so if, if I would encourage everyone, if you are online, no matter what it is, right, whether it's your brokerage account, your email, whatever, whether it's your pay, uh, PayPal account or Faith, you just have to make sure that you, you protect your own security. And then if you talk in terms of the company, if the company has done anything that is uh, wrong, you can always file a report against the authorities. Again, this applies for companies that are obviously based in the country lah, and then the the government authorities will investigate and, and make sure that nothing went wrong there. Yeah. Um, and for us to withdraw money from Luno, you only be withdrawn to our own account or we can withdraw to any people's account? You can only withdraw it to your own account. Uh, that is in line with the, I guess you can call it the AMLA money laundering rules. You, you can only put money from your own account, withdraw back to your own account. Uh, okay. And it can only be done in Ringgit, right? For Luno Malaysia? can only be done in ringgit that's correct yep yeah i guess there's still a way la. i mean if people want to help because you can send money ma, to other people through the app so if i mean if they want if you lose the access uh, to your account it could be still dangerous so guys please make sure your password login all this is uh secure and you don't let other people know the password login all this do you have a uh, two-factor authentication yep we have two-factor authentication and then we have a, a, a series of, on the back end, like, I cannot share, but on the back end, we have a series of checks to make sure that if, if something looks weird, we also have some, some checks and balances. Like. For example, if somebody logged in from, say, a IP address, which is overseas, if we notice that, we immediately notify you, I ask you to log your account if it's not you. These are standard procedures that we have as well. I see. So I believe that... In another word, if we want to invest in crypto, um, Luno is one of the safer app we can use here. How about the fees? Is is the fees competitive? 
yeah, I would say our fees are, well, competitive and also we have some of the lowest fees in town. So, um, and depending on your level of uh, usage, if you, if you trade a lot, you know, you can even, there are ways to even get to trading for 0% fees. I mean, a little bit complex, so we don't have to go there, but um, you can actually reach that kind of tier. If you have do, done a lot of trades, you can actually do trading for free. How, how does it work? Like the normal fees is like what? If, we, if I do trades on the platform, it's like 1%, 0.1%. So we have a feature which is called instant buy and instant sell. That one, literally, you say how much you want, we quote you a price. That one is traded at 2%. Okay, so it's a little bit more expensive because you get the crypto instantly. If you go to our exchange product, which is, it looks a little bit like a stockbroking kind of exchange, you can queue orders for, I think the most expensive is 0.5%. Okay. 0.5% uh, trades whenever you make a trade. If you um, if you reach a certain level of say, I think the level is uh, 400,000 ringgit of trading a month, I think you can trade for as low as, uh, it, it goes down like 0 0.3, 0 0.2, 0 0.1, and eventually you get to 0%, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The good thing with trading with this kind of app is you get that a real coin, it's really yours, it's really a Bitcoin, right? Yeah. The, yeah, exactly. the transaction really happened because I know with some other apps, it's not. It's a. It could be a CFD. Right. Yeah. So, um, Aaron, I think maybe let's 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 get the big elephant out of the room now, okay? Yeah. <laughs> because if we see a lot of the comments, it's actually one of the biggest risks that even I myself um, have. Yeah. So, um, which is actually what we discussed earlier uh, before we went live. It's about you know the liquidity of the exchange, or rather the liquidity of Luno in itself, right? Because the exchange is filled with people that wants to buy and sell, and you need this sort of like liquidity for you to transact. And I believe this is um, what happened in 2017 to early 2018. So maybe you know you might um, you might want to address what happened then and what has transpired between then and now. And how 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 can you convince us that you know this sort of um, illiquid or bank run so called event is not going to happen again in Luno? Yep. So what happened in two thousand seventeen was uh, remember back then there's no regulations yeah there's literally no regulations so crypto trading is it's not illegal but there's no you know nobody knows the the status of it okay so we are operating mm -hmm. in Malaysia since two thousand sixteen. 2017, our bank then, which is Maybank, decided that they don't want to work with us anymore. Okay, so they froze the account. So when they froze the account, means that people who have money inside, if they try to make a withdrawal, it does not happen because obviously the bank has frozen the account. Now it took us a couple of months to try and persuade Maybank to reopen the account. So within a couple of months, what they allowed was withdrawal, so people can take out their money. However, they never, until today, uh, by the way, they never allow us to make any more deposits into the Maybank account. So that basically means in early or mid-2018, a lot of people will start to take out their ringgit, but um, there's no new money coming into the system. So the price of Bitcoin at that moment, it there's a lot of selling pressure, but there's no buying pressure. So the price keep falling down, falling down. So you would have seen a very weird price on the Luno Malaysia exchange in middle of 2018. Um, again, due to regulations, we cannot just, uh, you know, bring in Bitcoin from elsewhere and, you know, push it into the system and, and pump liquidity. It doesn't work that way. We actually had to apply for um, approval from the SC. We applied starting January 2019. We got our full approval to launch in October 2019. So since then, we have gotten all the, the required um, approvals. And then now we have a very strong banking partner, which is MBank. So you can see even in the newspapers, we, we mention MBank all the time. So people don't have to worry that we will have another issue with the bank because we now have a very supportive bank partner. Lah. So it's not going to be an issue anymore. Is it, is it because you are just reliant on one bank? Is that a risk in itself? Yeah, of course, there is a risk. Uh, it is a very small risk. Because... 
that's what happened to you and Maybank last time, right? Yeah. How how do you guarantee that Maybank is not gonna do the same? Yeah, it's Henry. different now. It's different. Sorry, I'm it's different because we have the full approval from the SC. So, you know, we literally have a, an approval from government related authority to say that we can do this. But of course, on the background, we continue to have conversations with other banks. Lah. So, yeah, very soon we will probably have bank number two, bank number three to, I guess, you know, if you're worried that the, the bank, M Bank tomorrow doesn't want to, to do crypto anymore, then we will have other alternatives. So, not to worry, we have contingency banks in the pipeline. Okay, yeah. so in summary, what happened in around 2018 is that the prices that was seen in Luno is a lot lower than the prices that was seen in your general global market, right? In terms of yes. Bitcoin and other cryptocurrency. And yes. this is because there is just no buyer and it's just a lot of seller, right? Yes. Okay. That's correct. And how how the situation have changed right now is you are saying that there is a stronger banking partner that um, is ensuring that this um, this event is not going to occur again. Yeah, and also we have approval from the government authority. That's that's the key thing here because back in two, 2017, there's there's no approval. You want to apply for approval, also you cannot get approval. There's literally no way that anyone can give you approval. Hmm. Okay. So um, there were some questions from Stock Big Page. Uh, I'm monitoring there both sides. Apparently, it doesn't show up in StreamYard um, if it's cross posted. So, two, I think, very relevant question. One is can we buy fractional Bitcoin? That means 0 0.1 Bitcoin, 0 0.025 Bitcoin. Yep, absolutely. You can buy as low as 0 0.0005 Bitcoin, which today's price, I think, is about. Six ringgit, uh, uh, five. No, I, I think it's like fifteen ringgit or something like that. So it's a very very small amount. So you don't have to worry about, yeah, fractional. So and then after that, we also have the wallet, right? The wallet in uh, Luno. So that one, that wallet, is it tied to our name or tied to, uh, Luno's name? But then after that, transferred to us. So that wallet that you have, is the the funds are managed by us of course however you know it's it's like your own bank account lah, or your own e-wallet in the sense that you can send out the money you can you can send out the bitcoin you can receive bitcoin into your account so it it behaves a bit like an e-wallet just that instead of ringgit then you have your bitcoin lah. yeah okay maybe aaron can you explain a little bit more about that because i know that a lot of people have been telling me you know, um, to open my own wallet and even like hard wallet, right? Especially if I, I if I have a lot of Bitcoin, can you just explain to us, especially like newbies like me and Mintek, right? What are the different types of wallets and why shall we, why is opening a wallet that is not an exchange wallet um, a move to protect your own kind of like safety for your Bitcoin and cryptocurrency? Yeah, so when you when you store your bitcoin crypto on an exchange like us we own the private key and the private key is basically the key that allows you to unlock your funds lah, okay so in other words we are behaving like what you would call a digital asset custodian so we take custody of your funds now because of the nature of the technology technically if you wanted to hold your own crypto you can self custody okay you can buy a piece of uh, hardware. It looks a bit like a USB, okay? And then you can actually transfer your private key or rather you can transfer the key that unlocks your crypto into this device. So this is what is known as a hardware wallet. Um, it's quite popular. I myself also have hardware wallet. I keep some funds on Luno. I keep some funds on my hardware wallet. So it all depends on how you want to uh, manage your own funds. If you say in terms of convenience, if you keep it on an exchange like Luno, it's convenient. Lah. But if you say that, you know, I don't trust people to manage it for me, I want to manage it myself, then you may want to use a hardware wallet. And if let's say I transfer out the, uh, let's just say I, I invest in Bitcoin and I transfer from Luno to my hardware wallet, can I, trans can I use this wallet to maybe go into another exchange? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Then um, 
why didn't people use this method you know um back in 2018 where they just take out their um cryptocurrency and from luna and and kind of like move it into another exchange yeah i think a lot of people did it actually okay. um however there are some people who maybe it, it's not a simple thing to do because hardware wallet you know it's like a usb stick you need to be a little bit tech savvy lah before you are able to do it so simple so i think for a lot of people they would just prefer to to just use luno to wait for the services to get stored uh, and for whatever reason they did not take out their their funds lah mm. okay thanks yep. yep so i think the key takeaway here um even though the whole concept is new is i think this entire cryptocurrency investing and trading thing right now is still in the infancy stage if you really want to trade it i think you should go with something that is regulated that's why i heard right if you go with something that is not regulated it sounds so dangerous you know nobody knows if they are trading against you nobody know where is your money being hold right so if you really want to then i think it's all about the fees it's more about the safety which i think uh, luno here Uh, at least is regulated by SC and you know where to find if you have any issue right so yeah i think uh, rondi do you have any other questions regarding um, the exchange where the money is being stored actually i have no problem with luno as an app right because for me i don't want to be tax savvy i just want to make money right as long as it's safe right and i know that you know if something goes wrong i know where to find right um then that's good enough i don't need to have my own wallet all these thing you know i just trust i just want to use the platform to make money right so okay one thing is uh, is there any interest bearing if i keep my money there or yeah. bitcoin yeah I, I i really love the question because um we actually if you look at luno global product we actually have an interest bearing account So people can expect between three to four percent per annum if they send their Bitcoin to the so-called savings wallet. We call it savings wallet. Now the only thing is in Malaysia, I'm still getting approval from the SC to launch this in Malaysia. So far, they haven't given the green light yet. So it's something that we are still working on, lah. But hopefully, in short near future, we will be able to offer this to Malaysians as well. You don't need to get um, approval from Bank Negara because, as far as I know. They need to approve if you are taking people's saving, isn't it? So it is a it is a bit of a gray area. Uh, yeah. a bit of gray area because technically this is not ringgit that we are taking. Technically, it is Bitcoin that we are taking. So you know, Bitcoin. Well, that's why we are still in the middle of discussion with the SC lah. It is not so straightforward lah to just launch this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, Rondi, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of uh, people talking about Remitano, Binance, and all this, right? So maybe, um, Aaron, I'll just give the floor to you, right? Maybe you can explain to us why shall we invest um, cryptocurrency or Bitcoin with Luno and not all these um, foreign exchanges, lah? You know? Yeah, I think it comes down to number one in terms of um risk and security again um you know premitano finance these are overseas platforms if you are comfortable to to take the risk um yeah i guess some people are comfortable to do it but again if you're new to it i would suggest that you start with something regulated because at least you know that if anything goes wrong you can make a complaint to the sc against me and sc will literally call me and i'll have to explain it but If something happens in say Remitano or or Binance, then um, you're not going to be able to to make that complaint so easily. The other thing about using platforms like Remitano and Binance, these are what you call peer to peer things, and mm-hmm. in a peer to peer trade means that you don't go through a a party like us, somebody who's regulated, somebody who uses a trust account. When you trade peer to peer, means Uh, Rondi will pay money directly into Mingtek's account, okay? And Mingtek will 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 send his crypto to Remitano. Remitano will send the crypto to to Rondi. Now, if you do this kind of thing, um, maybe a small amount is okay, but 
if you get to a certain level that the banks start to question, you know, the banks themselves, how come, you know, Mingtek is sending 25,000 to Rondi? You know, there may be questions around arising from that. And if you so happen to soy, you trade with, say, a, a person who is involved in illegal activity, then your bank account may have issue, you know, because you have become part of the investigation against that illegal activity. So these and are the risks, yeah. It could be I transfer the money, then he doesn't transfer a Bitcoin over. Yeah. So technically speaking, there is um, there are some measures that these platforms will do. For example, Remitano and Binance, they they also have measures to to protect against this. But I also know that fraud can happen, lah. Okay, like I pretend that I make payment to you, or you know, I go and cheat somebody. I I ask him to make payment on behalf of me. You know, all this kind of scam can happen. So. Yeah, again, I would say that if you're new to this, start with something regulated because I think that's the safest way to do it. Uh, yeah, so guys, um, I see a lot of comments about other platforms, which frankly, <laughs> me and Rondi, we are new. So when I look at all the other platforms, um, this is what's coming to my head. Uh, so don't hate uh, uh, as a stock investor, as someone that try many different platforms like Interactive Broker, eToro, all this. For me, when I think about investing or trading, um, when I'm choosing a platform, I don't care about the fees or what. Most important, uh, I don't want to worry my money will disappear. That's the only thing. It's already tough enough to make money buying and selling. I don't want to worry about my money. You know, is it safe being stocked here? So I think it, it's a no-brainer to go for a regulated platform. And in Malaysia, there's only three. So you pick which one. Uh, after you filter the regulation side, only you go and pick which one is the one that you like, which one is more convenient, right? Which one has more feature, which one has better fees. Any other platform, I think it's um, quite high risk, uh, right? Unless you are really, you really believe in that platform and you, you know, you know someone working in there or whatever. But other than that, if you are newbie investor, just like me, average in uh, Malaysian, I think you should go for a regulated one, right? So, yeah, man. Yeah, Luis here say he has good experience. Hey, by the way, I'm not promoting Luno, uh, right? <laughs> Whether you use Luno or not, Rondi and I won't get paid one. In fact, if you sign up with Luno today, um, I think Aaron is going to give you a promo code, which, full disclaimer, me and Rondi get $0 for this, right? So, yeah, man. So, Luis say I have good experience with Luno, and after the explanation, I'm more confident to trade with Luno than Remitano or local Bitcoin. Yeah, so this is what Luis is saying. Yeah, Kevin is uh, second that, right? So um, can you share what IQ platform? Oh, I think that one is not even a, it's not even a crypto platform, right? It's just a binary option. So it's sort of like, you know, it's a different CFD kind of uh, platform. Am I right? Yeah, never mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You guys I think, yeah. IQ platform, I think, is a, a binary platform. Probably CFD. Like, it's not, I don't think it allows you to buy crypto directly. Yeah, so, okay, guys. SC means what you know. SC means Securities Malaysian. Uh, Securities Commission Malaysia. They are like, the, you can think of them sort of like the police. Police of um, investment, right? Yeah, yes. they are like the, yeah. So, so anything investing, whether it's Bursa, whether it's a broker, whether it's uh, Kenanga, Rakuten, whatever, anything in Malaysia that do investing actually need to report to SC one. Yep, correct. So, and this SC don't play play. Huh? You do one mistake, their fine minimum is one million one. So, nobody is going to mess with them. Huh? So, so that's why uh, when I, this SC name, when it comes to my head, like any platform that gets recognized by SC, I will take them seriously. So, Bruno is one of them. Um, okay. So I think uh, in terms of the platform usage, we have all the questions being cleared out, Rondi, or from the Q&A uh, uh, I think so. Um, just now that one long explanation from Aaron should clarify a lot of things. So, I mean, okay, just maybe one last question for me, right? Because I'm actually a very skeptical person. Um, in terms of Luno Exchange, um, what would you consider like the highest risk um, with regards to what happened in 2017, 2018 to happen again? Um, yeah, like can, can it actually ever happen again where 
where your prices and the price of the global Bitcoin is not going to be the same. And so, what sort of event will that actually, what sort of event uh, might cause these sort of things? Yeah, I would say it's very, very highly unlikely because there's a huge bunch of traders now on the platform. And what happens if, if there's even a small difference, say, between the Malaysian Luno exchange price and, say, overseas, uh, let's say, on a cryptocurrency exchange overseas. If there's a difference, what people will do is they will just buy from the exchange that is lower, they will send it to the exchange that is more expensive, and they will sell. And then the prices you see in all the exchanges around the world will, will normalize. And so there will be small differences, but I don't think it's ever going to be that scenario where happened in 2017. That, that was a, like extraordinary scenario because the bank just decided to, to block the account. So in that situation, people cannot buy, is it? People can buy, people can sell, but people cannot put in ringgit deposit people cannot put in new deposit into the system so that is the block yeah uh, but again it's not going to happen again so yeah i mean like uh, if it happens and people can still put in ringgit but the price for some reason does crash it's a good opportunity to make a lot of money isn't it i buy from luno then i sell in remittinano <laughs> or something <laughs> yeah but it's not going to happen again la. so yeah so because yeah as, uh, as, uh, as we say Actually, right, do you guys know, uh, in, even in stocks market, uh, like, like if you look at top glove price, uh, top glove price Malaysia, uh, top glove price in, um, uh, in uh, Singapore, the top glove price in US is different, right? Could be at the same time, it's different. So there is a, a difference in the price and there's opportunity for you to make money if you can transfer the share you buy from um, Singapore to Malaysia to be sold here. But unfortunately, you cannot lah. Uh. But with crypto, for some reason, you can. So there is, I think, I tell you the truth, huh? there is a huge opportunity to make money by profiting and taking advantage of the price difference between different exchange, if you know how. Am I correct, Aaron? Yeah, I, I do know people who do it like their full-time job. They literally just arbitrage between exchanges. So, so there are people that just do this as a full-time job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do it. Uh, in their free time, they trade stock. Lah, but most of the time, they're trading crypto. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. And almost no risk, right? Well, I mean, there's always risk. Lah. You know, what happens if, if the market moves, you know, there's always risk. But I uh, know some people have been doing it. Some people even use bots or algorithm to trade for them. So, it's, it is something that's quite interesting. I myself uh, want to learn more about doing this. Okay. So... Yeah, but I mean, we are, uh, arbitrage, especially in exchanges that is in different countries, you need to take into consideration the FX rates as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But in Malaysia, there's already three exchanges. So, you know, technically you can arbitrage between exchanges, local, all Malaysian ringgit also, also possible. Okay. Yep. Okay, so, I think uh, again, somebody, are we on the Bitcoin and stuff, not no longer on Luno <laughs> and exchanges. Yeah, um, somebody pointed out the prices is not gonna be. There's no one global price, right? Every uh, exchange will have their own price. So, okay, guys, um, we have talked for one hour and eighteen minutes. I think now I want to go into my main point. <laughs> Actually, I've been waiting for this moment now. Once we clear everything that we need to clear the answer question, I get to ask my real question. So I'm super skeptical, um, not on the platform, but I'm super skeptical on cryptocurrency as a whole, you know. So hate me if you want. Uh, but for me, this thing is not a productive asset, right? There is no guarantee in its value. If I buy it better go up in price or else I'm going to lose. And if, if it drops, there's no guarantee that the price will go up and also, right? That's currently what I'm thinking. So for me to buy and hold Bitcoin is very risky. I would much rather buy growth stocks, even like um, companies that are not making money, losing money, one, but is growing, maybe has potential to make money. Those i rather buy because at least I know hey, eventually this company could be giving me um, maybe dividend when they are making money and hence that's why confirm there's a value. Going back to your question, uh, the valuation one, for Bitcoin, 
I don't see how to value it because it's not a productive asset or whatever Ethereum, um, Ripple or whatever cryptocurrency is just a currency to me, right? You correct me later if you think I'm wrong. And so for them to increase in price, it's just like gold, right? Yeah. And my, my good argument for that is uh, it could still work. Cryptocurrency can still work. You see gold also got people buy my expensive watch. Watch where got value, value one, right? Or art where got value one people want to beat up the price it will go up lah. so what's your argument on that right um if i am thinking like that and i think why well, bitcoin cannot invest because there's no value right it's like gambling just see who want to push it higher the more people jump in the higher it will go but the moment people you know stop jumping in then that's game over that's what i'm thinking so it's a bubble to me so what's your argument about that or maybe rondi you want to chip in or so can after this yeah. yeah. Let me right. let me just add yeah. Do you want me to answer first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think when we when we talk about value, uh talking about people jacking up the price or people dumping, that happens to any asset. Uh talk about stock market, talk about I mean it can be bonds, it can be commodities, anything, it can be gold. Um, you know, markets trade on hype. I mean we can we can do valuation, whatever. By the end of the day, if People, if 20 million people think that Tesla is going up and they pump Tesla, Tesla will go up. So in terms of that, I would say that that happens to anything. If you talk in terms of the specific, um, like, you know, is, is the asset producing value? Um, value can come in terms of, if you're talking about business, okay, uh, yeah, I, I, buy a, I buy a stock, then that, that business produces value. So by right, the, the business should, should come up with profit and then the, the value of the stock should go up. Now, I think there are other ways to, to define value. For example, when you buy gold, um, I would say that a lot of people are buying gold because they are worried that if they store their money in other assets, for example, whether it's real estate or whether it's the stock market, they want to hedge against the volatility of, of other things going down. So that you can say that gold doesn't uh, gold doesn't create anything. It's just a shiny gold metal. I know Warren Buffett said gold is just a shiny gold metal. However, you will also realize that countries around the world, the US government is the largest owner of gold in the world. If you say that gold is valueless, why do countries stockpile gold? Why do you know macro investors, why do they stockpile gold? Maybe they don't invest 50% of their assets into gold, but why do they keep 5 or 10% of their gold? And when I look at that, is I believe that that actual um, that actual trait of gold, which is ability to store value, is actually actually very very valuable. Um, so I know that it is not a it is not perhaps a mainstream accepted kind of thinking yet, and I know a lot of people don't believe in it. But I personally believe in it lah, and I think that a lot of people who are moving into Bitcoin also believe in that as well. Yeah. So. That's why I, uh, even when I when I asked a question, I also gave myself the counter argument. I mean, like it could still work. See, go worked. But go is something that the reason why it became go is for some reason, thousands and thousands of years ago, some people decided go is the gold standard, right? <laughs> go is the gold standard. Yeah. Uh, that's why that will become the main currency in the world. You no, know, locally, you can use whatever currency you want, but if you want a cross-border trade, we use gold, right? Because it's value away. And there is a chance that cryptocurrency can replace gold. I'm not saying it's not. Because this thing, as long as people, as long as everybody say, okay, let's use crypto uh, to replace gold, then it's done deal, right? Um, but there are so many different kind of uh, current crypto. So there's like Bitcoin, there's Ethereum, there's all this. So they could be like gold, silver, and uh, maybe obsidian, whatever, yep. whatever, gem. So how do we know Bitcoin or whichever coin would be the, the one that is really valuable? Right. So we look at the first thing is, of course, the limited supply. So there are only a few cryptocurrencies that have limited supply. Um, Bitcoin is, of course, the most famous of those cryptocurrencies with limited supply. Um, interesting fact is that Bitcoin's inflation rate today is... A little bit more than gold's inflation rate and i say inflation rate meaning the new bitcoin that's created every year it's a little bit similar to gold it's like two percent roughly i think gold is about 1.8 percent. i think bitcoin is like 2.5 percent but 
Bitcoin's algorithm in which new Bitcoin is created, that halves every four years. So in four years' time, Bitcoin's inflation rate is going to be lower than gold, which will make it a very, very scarce asset. So that's the, the one argument. The other argument is if you look at cryptocurrency, you look at metal, you look at anything in the world, it's not like a, what we call a, a bell curve distribution where you know it's like very, very fair. In fact, if you look at a lot of things in, in reality is that one or two people win the market and that one or two people will be your goal, will be your Amazon, will be your Netflix, will be your Facebook. Everyone is using them and everyone kind of forget about the rest of the thing. It is also your US dollar, your Euro, your Japanese yen. Everyone wants to use it and no one wants to use Zimbabwe, no one wants to use, uh, say, other kind of currency. So if you look at that kind of trend, it is most likely that even in the world of digital assets, it's going to be like that. There's going to be one, two, three, maybe five winners. And we think that it's going to be Bitcoin because Bitcoin, for some reason, has become the, the most established cryptocurrency asset. So it's sort of like a network effect. Yeah, definitely. Power law distribution network effect, 100%. I mean, the more people uh, use it, the more valuable it becomes. Point. I get the point. So, um, I think I mean, they agree a lot of the a lot of the comments are answering your questions also. <laughs> yeah, okay. Everybody here, I I believe uh, everybody watching this here, they all believe in crypto. They are just you know some people, people like Luno, like, some people all love Luno. <laughs> Yeah. So there's this one reply, okay? There's this one reply from um, Stockbit Facebook page, right? He says, from James, he says, when World War happens, Japan created Mickey Mouse currency. Bitcoin has value because it can hedge just like gold. So it's Mickey Mouse currency during that time. And uh, yeah, the gold is scarce. Bitcoin is scarce, but gold can't catch up with inflation rate. And if you know the issue of printing money out of thin air, you will jump into Bitcoin. Yeah, so I think there are a lot of really valid points in the comment sections uh, to answer my, your question. My, my biggest, my biggest, uh, uh, my biggest, uh, what we say, rebuild battle, which is already, I mean, it makes sense. Uh, there's network effect is what stops me from creating a coin, right? And then I get many people, I promote, make everybody use the coin then, I become the new Bitcoin. Like the ICO. <laughs> that's that's the that's the that's the big question. Yeah. Can, can so, so can you say the entire game uh, with investing in crypto and when in crypto you are you are, you you think Bitcoin is the one to go, right? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So if we are saying Bitcoin is the one to go, why would we make money buying Bitcoin? The entire thesis, am I right to say is, Bitcoin will replace gold, or at least 15% of it. And when that happened, given the same market size, um, the 8 trillion, 10% of it is like what? one 15% is like 1 trillion. Um, then the Bitcoin should at least double, triple in terms of the price in US dollar, right? And the reason why that will happen is because so many young people is rushing in and uh, it will become a new gold standard. The young people is treating this as a gold standard and it will be like a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more people believe in it, it will naturally become true. A am I right to say it like that? Yeah, I think that is one angle. That is the digital angle. Now, that, that is the digital gold angle. Now, if you look at the... Actually, I'm writing an article about why invest in Bitcoin crypto? Uh, there are, I don't know, six, seven, eight angles that you can look at. You can look at it, the growth angle. You can look at it, the currency devaluation angle. You can look at it from the uh, future technology angle that, you know, it, this is future technology that will replace, uh, that will help make payments across borders easier. There's, there's so many angles to look at it. Why I've been speaking a lot about digital gold because I, that's one that I believe is very strong and I believe in it quite uh, quite firmly. That's why I've been speaking about it like all night. Lah. But again, there's ten pot there's so many other potential angles. And you know, it, it just takes one or two of these to hit and then you basically get a, a huge increase. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but I'll send you guys some, some papers and articles that you can check it out yourself. Sure. Now, where do we follow up with you if um, we want to ask more information and we like to chat with you? Where should we go? Right? You can find Aaron in Stockbit as well. 
Yeah. Other, yeah. So if you like to follow up with uh, Aaron, you like this conversation, you want to, you know, follow up with him, you can go to Stockbit um, app and then you can type in Aaron Tang and then you can go and chat with him. I think there's an inbox DM. You can talk to him there or you can reply to his trade or other than that, where else can we go? Yeah, you can come to the Luno website, which is has tons of educational information material. You can come to my personal blog, which I, I write a blog called Mr. Stingy. That's mr-stingy.com. You can come, I read, I write a lot of articles about Bitcoin. But yeah, I mean, I, apart from that, if you still have more questions, you know, send them to Mingtek and maybe we can do a, another session like this in the future. Sure, man. Um, I need to run have... here. Yeah, because yeah. this session, we only managed to cover the basics. Um, I've only just sent one rebuter. I have like 10 more <laughs> behind. So I think we can probably do a part two in the future. But for now, guys, um, if you have anything you want to follow up with um, Mr. Stingy, Aaron, you can go to StockBit website, you can go to Luno, or you can go to his blog. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in tonight. Wait, uh, wait hold on, hold on. I think, um, Aaron, if I'm not mistaken, um there is some promo right some promo code that you can share for everybody here yeah do you, do you have the the code itself with you rondi or do you need me to type it up uh, can you I type it up it, i think yeah. it's i think it is stock bit luno right guys uh, while you guys are figuring out the you know the promo code maybe just let me share what's my my view i'm not saying bitcoin can buy in fact i almost bought it right but for me now, I won't buy it just to keep. Just personally, because all these uh, people watching may be my follower. I won't buy it just for keep, uh, as I have a lot of objections now. So for me, it can still make me money, but I will treat it more as a trading tool, right? Trading tool. So TA definitely come first, and the TA now looks great. It may break all time high soon, right? Um, if it can break all time high, who knows where is the higher it can go, right? So that is the whole reason why, you know, this entire cryptocurrency um, interests me now. So if you want, I believe you can use the same technical analysis risk management tool to trade crypto. So by the way, guys, um, you can download the Luno app, right? Right now, I think they are having some promotion, which is if you download the app, they can you can put in the promo yeah. code. At the app, there's one way to put in one place to put in the promo code, right? Which is at rewards. Am I correct? Yeah. yeah. Then you, so you go enter the code. Yeah. Enter yeah. In the code, which is stock bit luno, S T O C K B I T L U N O. It's already in the comments. So yeah, please put it in the uh, please enter this code. This promo code is for new users. Um, if you use this promo code and then you use the instant buy function which i told you about earlier and you buy 500 ringgit worth you will get an additional 50 ringgit worth for free so this is i guess you can almost call it like immediate almost 10 percent yeah wow. so yeah i mean you can use this and then you know if you want to cash out immediately also can but no i, 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 leave, I leave it to you no, guys man, i was just about to ask the question then i'm like stop stop don't be so cheap man just shut up <laughs> Yeah. yeah so yeah i mean i see a comment from marzi saying that oh it's for new user only and sad well you yeah, know if that's the case you know share it with your siblings or your friends or, or people if somebody that. you know found out about this this entire webinar and they just open an account but haven't approved can they still enter the promo code i think that's possible right as long as they have not bought before okay as long as they're not use somebody else's code they have not bought before and they're a new user then they can use this promo code lah. if you're existing you have not used any other promo code right can you can use no problem wow, free listening in. okay good <laughs> yeah. all right so thank you everyone for tuning in i hope uh, this is a very good reward for you for staying all the way to the end uh thank you aaron also for being so patient and you know answering all the question so um Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you want to catch up, you can go to the link that we mentioned just now. Okay, have a good evening, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.